morning. My name is Bruce Chapman. I'm an economist, a labour economist, an education economist from uh, the Crawford School of Public Policy and the Research School of Economics. When I heard the word women omics, I thought, I don't think I'll be able to say this word woman omics, and it's not that easy to say. And I thought it would be, when Shiro asked me to chair this session, it would be about some of the essential preoccupations of labour economics, that is in particular, about the pay differences between men and women, about the different treatment of men and women in the labour market, about what is written in the Old Testament, for those of you who don't know, that is a, one of two Christian books comprising the Bible. And it said in the Old Testament, and if a man be paid 100 shekels of, shekels of silver, then it comes to pass that a woman be paid 60 seconds shekels of silver, as if this is some kind of preordained rule for from God, some kind of natural order, but it's not, of course. And while women omics is about this, it is about much more than this. It is about gender roles, particularly gender roles in Japan, about labour market arrangements and the household divisions of labour. Critically, it is about demography, Japan's major issue of an ageing population. And it's about government policy related to childcare, parental leave, and, and, and much more, including immigration. And to take us through this and more, we have three talented and experienced commentators, Kei Kitazawa, Nabuku Nagasi, and Naomi Koshi. They'll be speaking in order. Their bios are in the program. I won't introduce them beyond what I've already said, except to say welcome so much. That is the order in which we're going. They're going. They'll have 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open it all up for discussion. So we'll start with, with Kay. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Professor Chapman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be a part of this prestigious event, Japan Update 2016. Um, as Professor Chapman um, uh, clearly mentioned, um, the women mix is not about just women's participation in the workplace. It is related to more uh, larger issues such as demographics in Japan. So um, in, the, in my presentation, I'd like to uh, give you a um, background and overview of womanomics so that I can set the context of following two presentations and our discussions later on. Right, so I will start with uh, Japanese uh, demographics. When we look at the population trend in Japan, it reached the peak 127 million in 2005. Right here. And it started to decrease rapidly after that. The government forecasts that Japan's overall population will shrink by a third over the next, fi next 50 years. If it continues shrinking at this current speed, the population of Japan will be roughly the same size as that of Australia by 2100. <laughs> so not only it is decreasing as a whole, but Japanese population also rapidly aging. By 2050, working age population who is above 15 and younger than 65 barely surpass the elderly population who are above 65. So this figure, uh, this illustration, clearly shows the increase of the elderlies, approaching 40% of port total population. The workforce will be half in 50 years. Yeah. So the implication for this, uh, so the, the implication of this trend for the Japanese economy and Japanese position in the world is very obvious. Japanese economy has been suffering from its long deflationary spiral for the last two decades. Um, pulling ourselves out of this negative spiral needs more workhorse 
as, an, um, as uh, His Ex Excellency Ambassador Kusaka mentioned last night um, in his speech, this is where Japanese government takes several measures, include, including bringing in more foreign workers. At the moment, there are 910,000 foreign workers in Japan, 60,000 uh, 60, new workers arriving each year. And advisor to Prime Minister Abe said last week that the government is planning to pass a new bill for foreign workers this autumn to expand the current foreign trainee system under which the workers are given entry for a limited period, which is to be extended for current three years to five years. Such policy is expected to double the number of the foreign workers in Japan, but of course immigration alone cannot help Japan's demographic problems. So Abe administration, oops, sorry. So Abe administration has vowed to stop the population falling and uh, population falling under 100 million by pushing up the birth rate. So uh, I'd like to quickly um, to look at uh, look back the past demographic debates in Japan. So in the last century, uh, Japan gradually shifted from the society of high birth rate and high mortality rate to that of low birth rate and low mortality rate. During this period, we saw a sway in political debates about Japanese population. At the turn of the century, um, with the development of industrialization, continuous flows of uh, domestic workers uh, into large city created a large urban population. Around that time, uh, the risk of the shortage of food and other products is the most pressing issue for Japanese policymakers. And thus, uh, they often argue that Japan is overpopulated around this time. So in, in 1930s and 40s, while Japan was engaged in, uh, in wars, having more children uh, was promoted under the slogan of rich country, strong army. But with the end of Second World War, <laughs> Baby boom brought Japan another temporary overpopulation. With severe competition for the access to housing, higher education, and employment. And that is why family planning and birth control policies were introduced in the late 40s and early 50s. So the image of a standard family with two, two children, working father and housewife wife uh, was idealized during this period, baby boom period. But since 1970s, um, the trend of decline in the birth rate continues. And it was but, but it was neglected due to the high uh, economic growth. It was only 1990 that the demographics came high on the political agenda again. And when we look at the labor market trend, there are two trends. Can be uh, there are two trends in the labor market. Around 2000, uh, the replacement of permanent workers by non-regular workers started to increase. 20% of male workers under 35 is worked on a temporary basis at the moment. And uh, at the same time, the average wage continues to decline since 2000. Again, the traditional model of standard family with two children, working father, and housewife uh, mother that I mentioned earlier was the um, was, not, was no longer financially stable, although that model has been the basis of the government labor policies and social welfare system. Um, oops. Right. And this traditional family model is no longer sustainable 
also from the viewpoint of each household. The number of the, uh, the, number of the double income household has already surpassed that of single income household. In other words, the household in which only husband works. You can see the, uh, uh, this double income household, the number of the double income household surpass the number of the single, uh, single uh, income household here. So given these trends in demographics and labor markets, there are two expectations for the Japanese women at the moment. One is continue working, and two is have children, at least two. So Womanomics first started as a theory that espouses the empowerment of women, arguing that enabling women to have access to equal, uh, equal participation in an economy and society will result in economic benefits and social progress. That was the original idea. But since it goes square with the need of utilization of female labor, Abe administration adopted women mix as a policy tool and has urged business firms to employ more women and promote them to more senior positions. And Mr. Abe's plan of building a society in which all 100 million people can be active, that was the name of the plan of Abe administration, decided by the cabinet uh, last June, uh, tried to take further steps. And in this plan, the government explicitly pledged to remove the obstacles for women to pursue their career while um, not having to uh, giving up having a children and other per uh, and giving up uh, other personal goals. So employing more women will not itself uh, solve the problem. Women need to be assured that even if they have uh, take a time off to have children, they will not lose out in the competition for promotion. They need that kind of assurance. But it's, as is often the case, uh, they do suffer from that kind of discrimination at present in most Japanese companies. So womanomics is not just about the, uh, the child care, it's about changing our working style. So what are the obstacles? So what are the obstacles for women to achieve their career goals at workplace? Uh, this graph shows the results of the survey in which uh, people are asked, to, uh, asked about how equal men and women are treated at school, at the top, at home, and at work. So interestingly, in education, uh, it's, can you see that uh, uh, approximately 70% of the people thinks that men and women are treated equally in education at the university or any other uh, educational space. But once they join the workplace, different story. And at home, uh, with more young Japanese men uh, becoming much more willing to undertake domestic chores in addition to taking care of their youngsters, uh, there is a slight improvement uh, in how men and women are treated at home. But looking at work, traditional gender role bias largely remains. So underneath uh, lying the long working hours, I think. So not so many Japanese company has, so five o'clock and go home, uh, that kind of culture. So uh, the Japanese company, um, uh, at, at Japanese company, overtime work has increased actually in these days as firms cut workforces. So about 22% 22, uh, 22 of Japanese employees work 50 hours or more each week on average, well above 11% uh, in the US and 6% in Spain. And overtime and long working hours are so common that it became one of the top reasons why there are few female managers in Japanese companies. 
And one survey done, were, uh, done by uh, Daiwa uh, shows that um, uh, shows that uh, the company uses an index in which if whether the employee's overtime is 69 hours per week or more as a um, evaluation for the promotion. So in the cabinet office survey, 40% uh, of female employees rejected a promotion on the ground that they don't want to undertake even longer working hours. But we should stop here and think again. It's not just about women, but everyone in the society is related to this problem. We all want to be active, uh, want to realize our dream, not just in terms of career, but personal life and in other fields. So in fact, um, one survey shows that more men want to spend less time at work, but can't in reality. So for the percentage, um, so for the men, uh, more, more people spend less time at work, but in reality, they have to spend quite a lot of time at, uh, at work. And for the percentage of the people who want to balance, oops, who want to balance uh, work and home, uh, work and home, and all of the activities such as work, home, community, and personal growth. And if we look at the percentage of people who want to balance that kind of activities, there will be, there will be no difference between man and woman, and that percentage accounts almost half of half of the those uh, who take these surveys. So, Jap so Japanese society as a whole needs sound uh, work-life balance. So. I've just got a um, question for you in the uh, auditorium. And uh, which of the following five measures has the uh, most uh, has the has the best effect on realizing work life balance the first one is giving uh, employees maternity or paternity leave the second one is giving the uh, flex time uh, rules uh, which is basically sliding your working hours then you can set the starting time of your work as you like and the third one is the option to work from home. The fourth one is switching to a temporary part-time work. And the fifth one is shorter working hours by sharing. Could you raise your hand if you think the first option works best? Maternity leave. Second option, flex time. Okay. Third one, working from home. Fourth one, switch to a temporary uh, part-time work. And two. The fifth one, work hours. Thank you. I kind of mistakenly giving away the answer here, <laughs> as you can see. But uh, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, the comparative studies that surveys 23 international companies in the UK, Japan, and other European countries illustrates that, that interestingly, amongst these five measures, only the, uh, oops, only the uh, shorter working hours by work sharing has got, um, has got uh, a proved effective in improving the work quality and improving the motivation and productivity. And additional leaves, such as maternity leave or paternity leaves, uh, only contribute to the motivation, while working from home has negative impact on performance and productivity. But there is a catch with work sharing. It will often entail that the decrease in income. So, what measures need to be taken here in order to promote work sharing? So I think the key word here is multiplying or diversifying. 
people cannot expect an adequate level of income just relying on, your, uh, on their job or the social, so, social security framework. Asset building through self-reliant efforts has become crucial for individuals to secure a stable life. So there are two policy and initiative proposed by the government. One is NISA, a Japanese version of the individual saving account. It was introduced in January 2014 to, to promote uh, individual investment in Japan. And its total investment has already reached to 1 trillion yen in 2000, uh, 2015. And second initiative is opening up the possibility of side businesses. In 2014, only 3.8% of the companies uh, allows its employees to take on any side businesses, even in their non-working hours. The same service shows more than half of the em employees, on the other hand, wants to do a side business if allowed. So in early uh, this year, METI, Japanese METI, announces that it will set up a guideline for side businesses. It will call for companies to revise its contract and rules of employment and will uh, modify unemployment insurance system to make temporary workers working on the side businesses with less than 20 working hours uh, eligible for this um, unemployment insurance system. And on workers' side, uh, they may want to use more free time to develop their skills. So government and companies should support their effort by providing subsidies and opportunities to resources for relevant training. And financial support for entrepreneurs is also considered within the government. In 2014, uh, METI plans a new program to promote entrepreneurship and investments into startups. This program aims at pushing the rate of establishment of new companies to 10% and urge young entrepreneurs start, uh, to start businesses by guaranteeing annual income of 5 million yen. Uh, most importantly, uh, it is necessary to reduce the gap between permanent full-time workers and non-permanent part-time workers. There is a wage gap between the two as large as 44%, including all allowance, bonus, insurance, and other benefits in the pay package. And also taking account of the wage gap between, may, uh, between men, and uh, men and women, female part-time workers earn merely a third of male permanent workers at the moment. So in the last upper house election, Equal work, equal pay was amongst the foresee of the election. So now the government is considering uh, the Pay Equity Act to ensure women and men, permanent and non-permanent workers, receive uh, equal pay uh, for the performing the jobs that are substantially the same. So if they have, uh, if they take on a job with the same responsibility, they will receive the same pay. So in addition to the effort made by the governments, I'd just uh, like to quickly introduce an, uh, introduce an example of female entrepreneurship in Japan. Uh, Wantedly is the name of, name of the company. I uh, can't see, but it's, uh, the name is of the company is called Wantedly. Uh, it's a Tokyo-based tech startup established by Mrs. Uh, Miss Akiko Naka in her 20s, four years ago. Uh, Wantedly is a social recruiting platform allowing employers to find potential employees by showing the details of job openings and how they would work in the company with possible future colleagues. So Wantedly become profitable in its fourth year with 350,000 registered users, 80% of them are engineers and IT professionals in their 20s and 30s. So speaking of the success of, of her company, the CEO uh, Akiko Naka 
said that they are not providing the normal matching, uh, matching service between job seekers and potential employers. What they do instead is to provide its client with opportunity to reach out for the people who like what you do, how you work, and with what kind of people. So it wantedly is in a way helps allowing flexible working style that both employees and employers can develop together. So as you can see, um, the job seeking behavior of young professionals are rapidly changing and so uh, does the uh, job them, uh, themselves. Most of the manufacturing and white color tasks in OECD countries are expected to, uh, to be replaced by automation or to be changed in its nature by introducing large quantity of information gathered through various sensors connected to the internet and AI and other cognitive computing technology to decipher its patterns. So in 10 years time, most of our job will not be making things or doing some analysis by ourselves, but making plenty of informed decisions and give instruction to the system based on the patterns they found. So management, liaison and coordination, design and creative tasks, and other human-related human tasks will be the mainstream of our future job. So jo jobs will be more fragmented, ad hoc, and less time consuming. So this trend is worldwide. So getting left behind is damaging for our already stagnated economy. So against this backdrop, I believe um, now is the time for Japan to really change its working culture. Adopting more flexible working style we will obtain more precious time to invest in personal life, uh, learning new technologies, and increase overall productivities. And so coming back to the uh, original question, will womanomics work? So again, it's not, about the, uh, it's not about only about women participation at workplace or childcare. It's about uh, the work style and the social system that we Japanese has been taking for granted and that needs fundamental reform. And I think all the necessary political tools are already there and we all know what we need to do. So what we really need now is the uh, commitment from the government and companies and each of the workers to uh, really push through such fundamental reforms through womanomics political tools. And we should get on with it, and it's either now or never. Thank you very much for it. Hello, uh, thank you for this, your kind invitation to this splendid event, lively event. And uh, I enjoyed um, Kitazawa's presentation. And mine will be more uh, econometric. Uh, um, but I will talk about uh, the advance that we have made and the challenges that remain. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about family-friendly policies, women's labor, men's household work, and fertility. Uh, today's talk is mostly based on my two papers and my past projects. One is the effect of family-friendly regulations on fertility, evidence from Japan using natural experiments. This was a paper presented at NBR Japan project last year and uh, Labor Employment Relations Association, American Economic Association meeting this year in January. And the second paper is the gender division of labor and the second birth. 
uh, labor market institutions and fertility in Japan. This is uh, by myself and Mary Brinton of Harvard University, which is forthcoming on demographic research. If I have some time, but I don't think I do, right now I'm, uh, the two papers are quantitative, but right now I'm ongoing quantitative, quantitative research comparing working mothers in Japan, US, and Germany. Well, let me talk about the situation in Japan concerning labor market and fertility. Well, gender wage gap is very large. It is 25% uh, for full-time workers. And the reason for this large gap is different shares in the implicit or explicit uh, employment contract. That is the slow track course and the fast track course, which is sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit. And the share of females in this fast track course is very low. And secondly, many women used to quit work at marriage or at their first childbirth. And these first and second point led to low percentage of women in managerial position. Uh, for the fertility, uh, Ms. Kitazawa has already given us a very detailed uh, history. Uh, well, uh, because wo Japanese women's life quite changed after marriage and after the first childbirth, there have been uh, uh, delay in marriage and postponing of marriage or to non-marriage, and because uh, very little non-marital childbearing is seen in Japan that results in low fertility. Okay, let's look at the, uh, some data. This is the wage profile. The black line is male full-time mean wage by age. So it increases when the experience increases with age. And the red line in middle is a female full-time wage average. It also shows some increase by uh, age uh, with the increase of the experience. And the third line is the part-time wage, which shows very near minimum wage, show no increase and very low. So we see wage gap between a gender in full time, but also we see a very large wage gap between full time and part time workers in Japan. And many women, as I said, resign work at marriage or at first childbirth and return to this low wage part time work, which is uh, enlarging the gender gap. The gender gap between male and female is, I said, 25%, but that is only for full-time workers. If we include part-time workers, the wage gap is much larger. And this is the low, uh, uh, total fertility rate of Japan. And as uh, Ms. Kitazawa said, there was 1.57 shock. That was called, that in that terminology, by newspapers and by politicians, because they were really shocked to find in 1990 that the 1989 TFR was below 1.6. So the politicians try to uh, make, uh, do policies that may help work and life balance, but the fertility continued to drop till it reached the lowest in 1.26 in 2005. And then it's slowly upturning right now to 1.4, uh, around 1.41. Okay, now let me talk about the labor market and institutions from the uh, male point of view. Uh, workplace conditions and norms. Uh, as uh, th this was also already mentioned, uh, there is a, uh, we have a tradition or custom of long working hours and overtime norms. Also, internal labor market is well developed. 
tenure is often re rewarded by promotions and wage increase. On the other hand, the external labor market is very weak. So there is less step up job turnover as compared to uh, Western countries. And the Japanese Supreme Court had supported this kind of labor practice, especially in 60s and 70s, that uh, uh, they gave employers authority, supported employers authority to require employees to relocate and to work overtime in return for high job security. One example is called TOA case where in, uh, the, it was a dual earning couple and the, they had uh, small children going to daycare and the husband was relocated to a place where they cannot live together. And they uh, went to the court and said that uh, they needed husband to, to, to balance the family's work because the female also, mother was also working. And they went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decision was, well, the husband knew that he would be relocated every few years because he was in the sales position. And, uh, and this child is healthy enough, not uh, in a special condition. So because this is a usual uh, practice, the family has to take it. So this decision really made people to think that it's hard to say no to this relocation uh, uh, order. And of course, informally, you, you may be able to say no, but uh, this relocation is often passed to promotion that many family takes this relocation order. And over time, also was uh, order was also supported by the Supreme Court that if the uh, labor employment agreement had some clause on this overtime, if the overtime order is within this clause, employees are to accept the, this overtime. So uh, regular full-time workers in large firms have few incentives to contest their firm's working conditions. Uh, this is a survey done by my team. It's a web survey to Tokyo metropolitan area, Hokuriku and Tokai, uh, the, the time leaving office. Uh, the peak, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., this is married men. Maybe it could be surprising to Westerners, I think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is for non-married female. If you are if you are a non-married female uh, at the office, the peak is six. <laughs> However, uh, you can see that many leave like at seven, eight, or even nine p.m. Uh, this is for married female. So married female are more likely to leave at five and six. And uh, these all include part-time workers. So you can see that we really have long working hours for full-time employees. Uh, okay, let's look at labor market institution from female perspective. Well, uh, for female too, if you have long uh, full-time workers, you are expected to work overtime when required. Uh, for females too, internal labor market is often rewarded by wage increase. However, looking at the time of the husband's uh, leaving office and the labor practice, Many wives give priority to the husband's job and quit work at marriage or at first childbirth in the past. Uh, those housewives are protected within social security system and wage is not taxed nor levied social security premium below about 8,000 to 1 million euro per year sorry, in Europe, uh, uh, many firms give dependent spousal allowance on top of sal sal salaries to the household heads. 
Uh, so if you are if you are wife of uh, salaried workers, even if you don't pay the social security premium, you are protected in health care. You are given full entitlement for a basic pension, and you are also protected for old age care. So uh, there is system that support housewives, and also system that. Uh, uh, presuppose husband's long working hours. So uh, about 70 to 80 percent of females used to quit work when they had their first child, uh, well, f found child uh, out of labor force. Uh, the quit may be at the marriage or at the pregnancy or at the first child birth, but anyways, when the ch first child is one, about 70 to 80 to 80 percent of females were found to be out of labor force. And the government, uh, because of the fertility decline, uh, rolled out many of policies in 1990s. Uh, equal employment opportunity law, that, that came before this uh, 1.57 shock. It was in late 80s. Uh, in, in 1992, job protected parental leave and leave, al leave was uh, implemented, and later on, leave allowance was also given. And they tried to, even though very slow, uh, increase the infant daycare centers. However, the result was uh, not very effective. Uh, this is the graph of, uh, this blue line is, sorry, this, this blue line is uh, uh, in labor force when your first child is age one. And this plus this is about 100%. So this green line is those who are out of labor force. And the National Fertility Survey has the longest five-year average. So I use this National Fertility Survey for five-year average. And you can see that despite the policies in 1990s and 2000s, the, the, those in the labor force was around 20, 25%. And those out of the labor force was 70 to 80% and showed very little change. Uh, by the way, this is, this is the yearly average of panel survey of adults that I'm going to use in the, uh, the analysis that follows. And this is to uh, a panel survey to those who are 20 to 34 in 2002. So the, these are for all the population. These are for to, to these selected groups, but uh, the, the percent the, the trend was uh, is about similar. Uh, and so in 2000s, government started new policies. This time, not just child care leave, but uh, they tried to change the firm culture. How they did it was first mandatory reporting of the action plans of family friendly policies and plans to the local Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare Office starting from 2005. Well, uh, if the, the firms give this action plan and meet the requirement of government and meet this action plan two to five years later, the firms were allowed to use Kumi mark, which is a small mark that one can put on the products. And I remember the human resource department trying to find at least one male who takes a parental leave because the government required one male to, to, to take the parental leave to get this crummy mark. So in around two, 2003, four, I had all the, many of the human resource department friends was discussing, okay, where is this one in this, our company? So, <laughs> so uh, but this, uh, as, uh, as I, I do interviews to human resource department. They say this really kind of changed their mindset. They had to talk and think about how to implement family-friendly policy within the firm. 
they had to think about the future uh, demographic change, and th they said they had many discussion after this. Also, from, 2000, uh, uh, from 2010, reduced our option to work six hours a day when a child is below three was uh, mandated. And this, I found, was a very strong policy. Okay. <laughs> This is, uh, I, I have now have two more years. Oops, sorry. Oops. Two more years added. And uh, this was a previous graph that I showed that, but uh, now I have two more years added and this blue line shows a very uh, large increase of those in workforce after 2009, and increase uh, continued. So these are the uh, policies that the government did 2005, this uh, registration uh, reporting, mandated reporting to large firms, of large firms. Leave allowance was increased to, from 40% to 50%, uh, re reduced our option uh, to, to larger firms that will be effective to birth after 2009, and uh, withheld portion of leave allowance abolished, and uh, reduced our option to all the firms. And this is panel survey, but I, I redeemed this analysis to microdata the labor force survey. And again, I found the same uh, speed up of work continuation after 2009. The data is uh, Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, uh, Millennium Survey of Adults, and uh, it's an uh, annual panel survey, and it's, it, 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 this is one of the best Japanese uh, data because of the high response rate, and also we have about uh, 1,400 males and females in the data. And uh, I used uh, difference and difference and difference and difference and different method, econometric method, which I'm not going to explain too much. I'm just going to the result. But uh, what I'm going to do is see whether the, the, the birth rate changed and work continuation changed right after this mandate of uh, reporting and right after the mandate of this short hour option. The mandate period was different by the firm side. Uh, the first mandate was uh, only to those with 301 employees and the second mandate was the timing was different between the employees with 101 and below. However, of course, these large firms and smaller firms are different. So what I'm going to do, and the increase in births can be uh, affected by economic growth, for example. So what I'm going to do is to look at the trend of the non-mandated firms and look at the trend of the mandated firms and see if there is any special change right after the mandate. And if there is, I will say that the, this policy was effective. Uh, but uh, I'm going to only show you some graph and also the results and not the uh, uh, details. Okay, this is the uh, reduced R policy in the first childbirth. Uh, this brown line is when the mandate was announced. And you can see that the birth, first childbirth rate went up right after the mandate. And this is a comparing group, those without this mandate. So the smaller firms, they had higher birth rate, but you can see that at this mandate, at larger firms, the birth rate went up if you look at this crude graph. I only used 30 to 34 years of old of childless women, whether they had children, because my data is panel data. And so here we have younger 
people, and here they get aging. So to con because fertility is very much con uh, affected by age, I wanted to control the same age group. So in order to do so, I only had to, I, I was only able to use, oops, uh, those in 30 to 34. But anyways, uh, in, 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 at this crude graph, you can see that there was an uh, increase in fertility rate. And uh, the result is that the reduced our option mandate increased the first childbirth. And because the first, oops, I, I have very few minutes. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> and the first birth significantly went up. Marriage significantly went up. And work continuation significantly went up. And the hour significantly was reduced. So that was the result. Uh, I have, and many other people have recommended the government that we need this reduced hour option. But it took five to 10 years for the government actually to really mandate this. But uh, the, 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 the reporting mandate and those, those uh, other uh, policy set the made the mindset of the company and so that the companies uh, uh, were uh, accepting this mandate by 2009. And the mandated reporting was uh, not effective in any of these. However, uh, when I looked at the ch child desirability among childless women, those who replied, I definitely want child, increased <coughs> after these two mandates. So it may have been effective on the mindset of childless women, that, uh, of women. Okay, uh, so discussion, child care leave alone was not enough. Uh, changing work norm was very important, and reduced our option was uh, very uh, mandate was very effective uh, for those to have child who are delaying their birth. Uh, but I didn't show you the effect on the second and the third birth. However, it was only effective on the first birth and not the second or not the third. So my next paper is about the second birth. And now I'm going to look at fathers, how fathers can, as a child care domestic work hour, is given uh, effect on the, is affected by the work norm and how um, it will affect the birth. Just two minutes. Two minutes, okay. And uh, there is two empirical research question. Is there evidence linking firm labor practice and work norm among males with Japanese gender role specialization at home? And is there a negative effect from the work norm at workplace and the behavior of peers? And is there evidence linking husband's low work share of household work to reduce probability of second birth? And the method is, uh, I will look, look whether the peer, the work, peer average uh, domestic work share of peer affect the, 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 the husband's domestic work, and whether the lower husband's share affects the transition to second birth. And the uh, estimation of causal effect, I, I used uh, whether if you move, if you change the firm size to uh, firm size where the peers have less uh, domestic work share, whether it affects their work share or not. And uh, about 23% change their firm size. So I, this is how I did the causal effect. And the result, I'm, I can, I'll be very quick. The peers does have significant effect. If the peer have higher share, you, you are more affected. If you go to farm size with lower share, you, your, your, your uh, domestic work share is also affected. Also, long work hours reduce the domestic work share. And uh, okay, this is, so, so this is the result. And uh, I won't show you on the effect of the second birth, but the lower husband domestic work share depressed the second birth. Uh, this was also significant. 
So the conclusion, well, evidence from many comparative studies show that very low fertility is more likely in the post-industrial context when gender inequality in household is high. And uh, in Japan, labor law that gives job security in return for employees' right to relocate in demand over time, and the tax and social security system protecting housewife have uh, had some effect in this uh, gender uh, uh, specialization. Younger women, however, hope to continue work and family, and the reduced our option and work-life balance policy of the government brought strong policy results to increase marriage and the first birth and permanent employed working women, which was very good. However, uh, our results suggest that the workplace norm influence Japanese men's contribution to household work. And for working mothers, husband's help is, is really in need for the second birth. So uh, my suggestion is that uh, Japanese employment practice valuing long tenure in one firm and, and teamwork while giving job security in exchange of employers' right to demand overtime work and relocation needs to be remedied. And it may take time, but the reform to su support dual income family with children is a must in the Japanese poli uh, policy. This includes the change in tax and social security policy protecting housewives. And I'm not going to talk about this. And this, uh, this was uh, based on uh, Abe Fellowship. Uh, which is not from the prime minister, but it's from the prime minister's father, by the way, so, <laughs> had this, uh, started this uh, policy. Uh, and uh, the use of the data was allowed under the statistics law. And some of the research was also from the next JSPS uh, project, both of which I was a principal investigator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Naomi Koshi, uh, mayor of Otsu. So uh, some, uh, many of my points are very similar, uh, already mentioned by uh, Ms. Kitazawa and Professor Nagase. So I'm gonna talk about what am I doing in Otsu. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where is, uh, Otsu is uh, uh, do you know Kyoto? It's uh, next to Kyoto. And the population is uh, 340,000 people. I think it's similar uh, here in Canberra. And uh, I, am at the, I am the youngest female mayor. And I was, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but I'm embarrassed because uh, when I was first elected, I was uh, 36. It's, that's not young, <laughs> but it's because uh, there is very few female mayors in Japan, only 2%. And uh, so what's happening in Japan now? And uh, so Ms. Kitazawa already mentioned these issues. We are losing population and uh, less and less children. And uh, so the, what is the next? Uh, labor shortage. And uh, it's happened in some industry like construction and decreased consumption and uh, a related heat to economy. And uh, governmental side uh, decreased tax revenue and we have to cut some service to uh, elderly people and we have to, uh, we have to plan to close some city facilities. So the solution is women. <laughs> And the national government uh, uh, last year, uh, here is a new act. 
So the Act for Empowerment of Women in Workforce. And uh, I think there are two uh, problems. Uh, one is child care, and the second is uh, at workplace, uh, long, uh, long working hour. And uh, the first one is child care. So uh, as Professor Nagase mentioned, many women uh, quit work after they have children. And uh, it's because, uh, mainly because they cannot find uh, childcare. They cannot find nursery. Uh, last year, uh, all over Japan, uh, 20, 23,000 uh, Japanese family cannot find uh, nursery to take care of their children. So at that case, uh, women have to quit to take care of their children. And we call Taiki Jido. Uh, it's a waiting child. Uh, so many child, many mothers, actually many mothers, waiting uh, nursery to take care of their children. So what did I do uh, in Otsu for the last uh, four years? Uh, so I increased, increased city uh, oh, subsidies, subsidies to private nursery and open new nurseries, uh, 29 new nurseries for 2,000 children. Then, uh, so mothers can find a place to take care of their children. And now in Otsu, the birth rate is, has increased. And also the number of uh, working mother with uh, children under the age of five has doubled. So this is, uh, I focus on child care in Otsu. So now the uh, situation is Otsu, I think is better than other cities. So the second problem is uh, few female leaders. And uh, so the uh, first of this uh, conference, as uh, Simon mentioned, about new uh, female leaders. Uh, Governor of Tokyo, uh, Yuriko Koike, and Renho, uh, but still very few. And so 3% so corporate executives and 12% national leaders and 4% governors and 2% uh, mayors. So the, how about uh, old city hall? The situation is the same. Uh, officially 22% uh, employees, uh, female employees, uh, management position. But actually, it's uh, only five. Uh, so excluding uh, nurses and kindergarten teachers, only 5%. And uh, they said, uh, why they, they said they don't want to work, they don't want to be promoted because they have to work longer, they have to stay office late at night, and they have a lot of things to do at home. It's very different from their husband. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the problem long work hours, so this issue already mentioned. And uh, now, uh, what am I doing in Otsu? Uh, I try to reduce uh, work hours, so a little over time, uh, two days a week. Also, as a problem is uh, evaluation system. Before, we evaluate employees based on hours they work, but now we try to uh, evaluate what they do, but it's sometimes hard. <laughs> so, 
the conclusion, uh, like what we should do is women can stay in workforce after they have children, and women, women can take uh, the same role as men. Then uh, the birth rate is up, and the population crisis and labor shortage problem will be solved. Uh, one survey said if women can work as the same as men in Japan, Japan's GDP will grow up by 20% in next 20 years. So final conclusion, women can save Japan, but it's very, it's easy to say, but very hard. Some, sometimes I feel very uh, hard because some people are very conservative, but uh, I'm trying every day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Naomi, you might say you're the youngest f uh, female mayor just because there are so few women mayors, but let me assure you, 36 does seem to me to be pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> We've got plenty of time for questions or comments. Just um, tell us your name and keep it brief. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mana Takashi. I'm uh, currently a visiting fellow at ANU. Um, thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. I learned a lot and quite impressed as a Japanese woman. And also, like when I was working in the private company in Japan, I was really feeling uh, invisible pressure from many places. So, yeah, it's so impressed. Um, my question is about. Um, Actually, I'd like to hear about your opinion about the issue of women's poverty in Japan, because um, currently, like um, many women are suffering from the poverty because they have only kind of like just a uh, one million or two million in Japanese yen as an income per year, and usually they are and they are mostly like kind of the divorced women or, or single mother. And sometimes it's very hard to find uh, such kind of women because they are even not um, part-time workers. So um, for this issue, like what kind of like safety net or uh, policy could be a solution to save uh, such kind of like uh, poverty women in Japan? Um, should we make that for all of you? Yes. No, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, your point is very important. Uh, many women, uh, after uh, they get divorced, uh, it's very hard for them if they have children. Like, they have to they have take care of children, and also they have to work. And uh, so now in Otsu, like uh, I mentioned Taikijizo, uh, it's very hard to get in nursery. But if you are single, uh, it's a first priority. Uh, they can find place, take care of children. But about the wage, uh, it's still uh, hard for cities to deal with. So uh, private companies. So so sometimes, uh, like, so it's very hard that part. I, I did survey to single mothers many years ago, but I did microdata analysis as well as interviews and surveys. And my impression was it is difficult for mothers to work, period. <laughs> so so uh, the, the, the interview was done in 2001, so it was a long time ago. But um, we really need to reform this wage system that prefers head uh, 
breadwinners. And we really need to change the wage system and whole system. And th that is required for uh, women, uh, women to get out of this poverty. I think my answer would be the combination of the subsidies for the single parents. It's not just about women and the single father too. So those who are raising their kids alone need to receive more subsidies. That's the first option. And the second will be training, more training and resources for uh, the women who tend to be less, who tend to have less access to the uh, those kind of training. So increase the subsidies and training options. Yes, Tony. Um, my name is Eva and I, uh, I, I enjoyed three presentations very much. I'm just curious, uh, um, um, one, one question to uh, Kitazawa-san. Uh, Kitazawa-san showed us uh, a chart of single income and double income uh, household. And do you have any uh, number, uh, figure of single income by wife? Uh, because uh, because um, I, I know a friend uh, um, who, uh, who are married, and after having children, the husband instead of wife uh, quit a job. And uh, because uh, um, his, his wife uh, earned more, so they decided to, to uh, he decided to be a house, a house husband. Mm. And some of the uh, child care uh, leaves, uh, in, in, my case, in my experience, uh, taken by my husband instead of wife, very few. But if you have uh, any impression or uh, upside news uh, of uh, uh, such case, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. OK. I think it's really a good point, and I should have looked into that data, but, but I, I, I will look into it. Thank you. Yes, over here. Hi, I'm um, Carol Hayes from ANU in Japanese Studies here. I have a question for Koshi-san. I just wondered about if you could give us a bit more information about your um, no overtime, two days a week right. policy. Um, do they choose which day, or is it like Wednesday is a no overtime day? And have you had any response from, so I presume it's for men and women, is it? And that have you had any increase in male works, work life balance satisfaction because they can go home? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, two days are fixed uh, Tuesday and Thursday. And, uh, yeah, and now, yeah, also men uh, go to uh, home area, and they are, especially young men have, uh, who have children are very satisfied because before they, can't, they couldn't take care of their children. But now uh, young father won't take care of their children, so they said, yeah, they are happy. What, what Ah, oh, as a five, sorry. Just out of curiosity, how, would you, how do you enforce this rule? <laughs> <laughs> how do you make it happen? What do you mean? Uh, how enforce it? How, how is it monitored? Do they pretend they're oh. high in the toilet? <laughs> 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 but it's a, uh, we shut down office and uh, so they have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Thanks very much to all three speakers. Really appreciate your presentations, and you've given a really nice picture of the interplay of government policies. Oh, sorry, I'm I'm Jill from ANU. Jill, my brother's team from ANU. Um, what I wanted to ask about was, in the face of that, those various policies um, and strategies to get women um, back into the workforce. Um, I wanted to ask what your opinion or experience was of really stubborn social norms and whether uh, those policies are having an impact on those uh, social norms and if there is any movements to change those social norms because often when I have seen uh, the policies put in place I've wondered um, in reality for women uh, in their workplace is that having a real effect on the norms that they encounter every day. 
um, both from women and men in the workplace. You'd like to go? Is it working? Are the social norms able to be changed? Yeah. According to my impression, uh, there is an increase of women who have permanent work status who also does the household duties. And men tend to take the children to nursery, which is very different. I mean, my, my age, very few men went to nurseries. But today, you often see men taking their children to nurseries. But uh, according to my interviews, the, one of the better couples, uh, maybe once a week, husband do, the over, uh, do take care of the child, and women do the overtime work. But uh, once, another once a week will be uh, dependent on paid uh, maid type or a child support type of. Uh, and uh, well, there, of course, there is a change. But is there a real equality? Well, uh, <laughs> still uh, much to be done, I guess. Yes, come. Yeah. And then, yep, yep. <laughs> Colin Lyons is my name. I'm here in a private capacity. My question is for uh, Nabucco. You referred to the internal and external labour markets and said the internal markets are strong and the external is weak. Um, presumably that means there's a strong disincentive for people to seek employment outside their existing employer. Is that uh, a cultural tradition which is unlikely to change and do you think it has a significant impact on labour productivity which Naomi referred to in her discussion. Uh, the, the, the practice is different between large firms and smaller firms. At smaller firms, there was turnover. And wage do not increase as much as the larger firms. So the incentives to, to stay is lower at sm smaller firms. Whereas if you're an university graduated male who got into this best firms, you can expect the, the wage to increase quite much. And uh, you, you will be losing, well, there are more increase in, uh, in job change, but still many would like to stay because especially if they stayed up to 30, 32, maybe they want to stay there uh, because of the expected wage rise. And does this have any effect on productivity? Well, uh, in my view, uh, it does attract uh, loyal, lo loyalty of a high uh, performance uh, males, but uh, when the market labor, when the market change rapidly, you might need the new new um, talent. And are we good at recruiting these new talents? I don't think so. So this is one of the problem. Even though we, I do see some good points about this long term employment relationship. Yep. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative and thought provoking. I have one question to. What's your name, please? Uh, my name is Yusuke Fukuta. I'm an exchange student, uh, exchange student from Japan and currently study at ANU. I have one question to Ms. K. Uh, in order to fill the income gap between um, permanent and non permanent workers, is it necessary for Japan to get rid of um, seniority based wage system? Because the income gap actually increases <coughs> as the workers get older because the, wa the wages for the permanent uh, workers increase due to the perm uh, seniority based wage system. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I think the uh, Japanese company needs to shift from the seniority based system to a merit based system. That's the, that's, I think, the uh, like a critical base for introducing uh, the work sharing too as well. Yeah, him and and second. Hi, uh, my name is Nahoon. Um, I've got a question for Nobuko. No um, thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned that um, one of the main ways, the main way that we could increase. Um, women's participation in childbirth was the mandated 
um, lower working hours after giving birth to a child. Now, I'm just wondering whether that is how, how mandated that was. Was that an absolute prohibition on um, uh, longer working hours? Because I find that overtime really is a, a cultural thing. If everyone is giving you pressure or if there's a work culture within the firm for there to be overtime, then the women will continue to work regardless of what the policy really is. So was that a prohibition on the overtime or was it more of a policy that was discretionary as to whether you implemented it or not? Uh, this work-life balance discussion uh, was became heated after 2005 up to now. So large firms, uh, they do feel and think that you have to let the woman with children go home uh, with six hours a day work because it is mandated. However, we do hear many uh, discussion from colleagues that because we do in a teamwork, because the work is not individually based, but because it is a teamwork, I do hear many complaints from the colleagues, which may lead to decline in the new hire of permanent female employee. However, for those who are already there, especially at large firms, it, it, they, many women do can take six hours a day. And uh, actually, there is a discussion that more women are taking too long. Some for good firms oh, uh, let that woman to take a uh, short hour option for like nine years or 10 years. And there is a discussion that this is too long. With overtime for men, even, it's not something that is compulsory. Um, men you know, work over time because they're expected to or because the culture says that they need to. But if you wanted to, wouldn't you also leave at 5.30 every day or would you sit by and no, 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 you, you're not fired. However, it may uh, dampen your promotion prospect. And because you are in this long-term employment relationship, especially when you are young, and when you think you have the prospect, you do not want to dampen it. But then doesn't, if you work only six hours a day for women who have just given birth, doesn't that also affect their employment? Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is the problem that we are discussing, that I, I didn't raise hand for the reduced hour when you gave the five option, because reduced hour is good for balancing, but it really dampens career in any country, I think. In, not in Japan, but in any countries. Over here. Hello, Greg Jaros, Trade Consultant. Are there any companies or businesses that you can point to as models where they've automated very heavily, used innovation, streamlined their business processes to reduce over time so that there is more family time? Because to me, it's a, it's a little bit of a quandary where if you're efficient, uh, you're using innovation, you're uh, streamlining your processes, why would you need so much overtime? In labour economics, basically, over, over time comes from the, the observation and the likely reality that there are high hiring and screening and training costs. So using workers who have those skills, usually specific training skills, and even paying them more is often a much more sensible business decision than it is to put on extra labour when the extra labour doesn't have the skills that are specific to those tasks. But that's just a personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to add anything to this? You want to? I just want to suggest you, unless you're constantly expanding your operations, if you've reached a plateau and you're very efficient at that point, why would you need so much more overtime? Mm. Because you're very efficient, you're very effective in what you're doing. <laughs> According to my interviews in America and in Germany, I do find that many managers work from home. So they go home early, like at five or six, and eat dinner, but after then, they often work from home. Whereas many Japanese seem to work at office 
and and finish and then return. So may, maybe this is one difference. I, I will. Okay. Anyone? Look, we have time for one more. No, two more actually. Down here in the middle and up the back. Hello, my name is Elisa and I'm from the University of Queensland. Um, my question is for Ms. Koshi. Um, just in relation to women's participation, um, perhaps in uh, the city halls and municipalities, um, I was just wondering if you could talk on perhaps the sexual harassment that women tend to face in those areas. Um, there was a survey that was recently done that I think, I'm not quite sure of the percentage, but quite a large number of women um, experience sexual harassment in municipalities, mm -hmm. and so I was wondering if you could. Yeah, speak on I that. think uh, that's right. At the city hall, uh, we have some, but before they uh, don't, uh, they don't tell. There's uh, some harassment, but uh, they, if they, they think the women think if they uh, report, uh, it's like embarrassing and. Uh, they may be hurt uh, as our employees, so they don't report, they didn't report before. And now uh, I became a mayor, and I said, uh, you should report because it's a problem. So now uh, there are more cases, but now I think we are uh, shifting, uh, we are changing. But I think the bad thing is uh, no harassment, because there are, I think there are, harassment everywhere, but uh, if some places they can't report because uh, there is some pressure, so I think it's, we are fixing now. So what, what is being done to fix? Uh, so like uh, we have a new, uh, we have now uh, lawyers out of our office before they have to report their uh, boss and it's a man, uh, sometimes they do harassment. So we have some other, uh, so now they call uh, lawyers outside office and uh, we are uh, change, try to change. Yes, last, last question or comment. Thanks, um, my name's Al Rizvi, I'm from the University of Melbourne. Um, I certainly agree with your final conclusion there. I think you, you're absolutely right, women can't save Japan. Um, my question therefore relates to childcare. And um, I noticed you mentioned, um, Ms. Koshi, you mentioned that uh, your, your, um, your city uh, subsidises uh, childcare providers. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you had considered in that context whether it may, may make more sense, given the low wages of childcare workers, mm -hmm. to subsidise the childcare workers rather than the providers. I was wondering whether you thought about that contrast at all. Right. And my second question related to immigration and whether uh, or, and where things were up to in Japan in terms of filling those childcare places, worker places, mm -hmm. through immigration. And if you were considering that, would you only consider that as, as guest workers or would you consider them as permanent migrants or is that out of the question? Oh, yeah. I, I think both. Uh, uh, your question is... Uh, uh, can you, would you subsidise, would you consider subsidising the childcare workers rather than the childcare provider? Uh, provider. Rather than the yeah, but, but the, uh, the payment, uh, the, uh, the, so parents have to pay, but it depends on their income. So if you have uh, low income, it's, you have to pay less. And if you have, uh, like, more income, you have to pay more. So. I, I think we'll close down the questions, and uh, but not the answers necessarily. If you'd like to add a few comments at the end for all of you, would you like to? Anything to say? <laughs> Anything? No? So in 1982, Peter Drysdale and Yoko Sano convened a meeting, a conference at the ANU on a comparison of Australian and Japanese labour markets. And Yoko Sano, who was a professor of economics and a woman, uh, was talking essentially about this issue. It didn't have the word womanomics, but it, was, it really was about what she was describing and, and explaining as, as discrimination in the labour market. And a senior person said, well, if there's so much discrimination, how come you made it to professor? 
And I was thinking, I don't think anyone's going to say that today. And one of the reasons is that this is not a topic which is just seen to be the eccentricities of female academics and politician. Change does come, but it comes so slowly. And the basic proposition that uh, anyone could, be, any woman could become easily a professor of economics was very weird then, and perhaps not so weird, although clearly there are lots of spaces to go here. I just want to share with you um, some policy analysis that comes from the ANU by my colleague Timothy Higgins, who's an actuarial statistician who modelled with statistical methods the concept of extending paid parental leave as a household but income contingent debt. Your arrangements in Japan are like ours, that people don't get much more than a few months, up to six months maybe, to look after a newborn child. And so your basic choice, because it's fundamental market failure, banks will not give you money to look after a child. You've already signaled that you're not in, in the labor force and there's no collateral. But what Tim did was to ask the question, could households get a debt which would be repaid in the future depending on the nature, uh, the, their level and the uh, basically their levels of income. And he modelled it in a way with a, a small surcharge that the subsidies were, were pretty much zero. And that's the kind of intervention that I think we could think about, which doesn't leave Japanese women and women just about anywhere, which says three to six months, that's all you've got, so you must sever the relationship, employment relationship, which of course will affect all your investment decisions in on-the-job training. So I'd recommend that work from Tim. Um, I'd also recommend that we have lunch, but could you first, uh, before that, thank our speakers for their contribution.